Welcome to Women Futures. I'm Anessa Lee, your tour guide to the future of female kind. And today my first guest is a pioneer of the transhumanist movement and the designer of Primo Post Human, Natasha Vida Moore. Hi Natasha, you're one of the most prominent transhumanists worldwide and I'm really excited to start our Women Future series with your interview. Now I really like your name, Vita Moore sounds so beautiful. Could you explain what's the significance of it? Thank you for asking and I'm delighted to be here at the launch of your amazing podcast that I think is very important and also will be an incredible learning tool for all of us. My name. Thank you for asking about that. Vita more means more life, basically. My uh, interest in uh, Italian aesthetics is the precursor for the Vita, and also my um, interest and devotion and advocacy for longevity, uh, healthy life extension, is the second reason. When I lived in Italy, I went to school there, I was amazed at the, the beauty of every aspect of Italy, including the laundry hanging in the alleyways, the, the colors aesthetic to the paint chipping off of windowsills. Everything had a certain place and purpose and beauty, even if in its decay, which made me think about longevity, that even though aging is a process of decay, as we well know, it's also a process of beauty in the maturation of our wisdom. So with the wisdom and the maturity of longevity comes also the revitalization. So Vita, life, and more. Indeed, it's my husband's last name. So rather than going by more, I go by Vita more. So there's a profound philosophy to your name, and it makes a lot of sense. But now let's talk about politics. As of today, women make up 23% of the U.S. Congress. Do you think in five years from now, the number will increase? Yes, I do. I think the numbers will increase, not because of a, a search for a majority, but an increase because more women are currently active in politics. For example, we take a look at what the number of women in politics are in our, our governing bodies here in the United States, our Congress, our Senate and representatives. And to think that Congress holds 23 and a half, well, let's say 23.6% of the 532 members are women and 25% of Senate is not much, but this is declining. Uh, the, that, that separation of, of powers as far as gender-based power. And I think members will increase along the, the female spectrum as women learn more about economics. Men have governed uh, globally in most regions of the world for eons and women have always taken a back seat largely, not exclusively, but largely. If you consider the fact that in the United States, women didn't get the right to vote till 1920 with the 19th amendment of our constitution. So that is 144 years of the United States being in existence where women were not allowed to vote and largely not allowed to own property. So there has been a big change in that 144 years. And if you compare that to longevity, where our maximum lifespan is around 123 years that we hope to live healthfully, it makes that 144 years seem daunting at best. Considering the fact that women could take on a majority, I think is less important or significant than the political message for which that majority could incite. A majority is not always a good thing when we're considering democracy. For example, I think we learned this with the um, Beyond Therapy report created by President George W. Bush's Bioethics Council. And that council or committee was largely and exclusively all white men and largely, if not exclusively, religious and had a particular moral stance that was the majority. And we take a look at their governing and their decision-making about stem cells and uh, certain biotechnologies. It was verboten, it was prevented. There was a moratorium put in on stem cells because the issue was women might um, get pregnant and abort 
to make money off of their embryos. Well, I find that rather insulting and disparaging of women. Certainly there are black markets and that could occur, but making that a dictum for um, the uh, looking at biotechnology as a bad thing based on that, I think is both unethical and even immoral. Right, ladies, we can become the majority, but think it over, do we actually need that to happen? Yeah, yeah, I mean, a majority can be a good thing, but when you take a, if we look at it, if it's, if it's all women with a majority, what happens is a mind think. People start parroting each other or becoming each other. And this is a human psychology that has been identified in the field of psychology and human behavior. We, pretend, we start to uh, have a pretense about what our beliefs are based on who we surround ourselves with. So majorities are not always a good thing. And I think that having a majority might be um, beneficial in some ways, but certainly not advantageous in all ways. Now you have served as the elected city council in Los Angeles County. What was your experience as a woman in politics? It was a unique experience, I have to say. And frankly, I didn't even consider being a woman because I've always been politi politically inclined. But the fact that I ran on the Green Party ticket as a woman was quite unique because it was largely male dominated, especially um, with uh, Michael Feinstein, who uh, was one of the, the leaders at that time uh, in the Green Party in the United States and in Europe. And he did marvelous work and I have enormous respect for him. But running on the ticket was really interesting. Um, but more interesting was creating a platform. And what I did was uh, create a transhumanist platform for technology to counter the, the uh, negative effects of climate change and, and looking at the precursors of global warming. I thought that nanotechnology, for example, would be an excellent technology for helping to clean up some of the pollutant mess um, of industrialization, as well as the use of artificial intelligence to gather data, to find out where the, the environmental issues were coming from, what could be the causes and what could be potential solutions to uh, that area. Being a woman, I think was secondary to uh, the message that I was presented and, and that message stemmed from a TV show that I was hosting at the time. And I think because me, the, um, the TV show was, was unique, it was seminal um, in Los Angeles, if not in the country, uh, that it, people were interested in what I was saying and what I was doing. That TV show was called Trans Century Update and it started in 1987, I think I went to about 1994, 95. And I had on primary thinkers in their specific fields dealing with longevity, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, uh, electric cars, space exploration, many different areas. And uh, it reached 100,000 people in Los Angeles and had its own um, uh, channel on in Telluride, its own uh, program in Telluride on the, the Telluride TV channel. That's very impressive. Sounds like you had quite an amusing media experience as well. What's your advice to women who want to actively get involved in politics? I would say listen attentively to the, um, the political discussion and debates in, uh, that are currently going on and what people have arrived at, the decisions and how they arrive at those decisions. To um, basically identify a topic that you're skilled at and passionate about. That's really important. And um, look for any gaps that others may have skipped over or silent areas that are not being spoken about. So if you, if you find that passion that fills a gap and then the next thing is to see what others are saying about that topic and what is being said that can be maybe understood as accurate or scholarly or informative in areas that are more opinion and to separate out the facts from opinions because opinions are subjective and facts are objective. And I think it's very important to take that logic gap, that silent area and be a study about the larger area around that. So you're not single-minded of that one area to understand how the, the socio-political economic arena addresses that topic. So you'll have a, a varied perspective and you can understand that passion point um, 
through the lens of different fields and understandings, because there will always be controversy and different opinions and debates. So to be informed about what the, um, the other side might be saying and to understand, I mean, to truly to give it, give it some thought and, and foresight so that it's not um, uh, an anti-position, but a position where you understand your opponents and can reason with them through that level of understanding and a level of, of compassion to be sure. It sounds like education is the key. Now, ladies, you know how to get politically active. Natasha, how would you define the term woman in power? And what is it really like for a woman to have an authority? Women in power, the phrasing of it um, refers to uh, a career occupation that gives a person here, a woman, the authority, influence, and responsibility. With power comes responsibility. So I personally define women in power uh, as those who use their authority and influence to balance equity. Uh, having power is one thing, but as we've seen, women in power who are ineffective, egocentric, and are selling their business, become CEOs of businesses and sell a product, uh, rather than educating. I think there's nothing wrong with business. I'm a free market person myself and support businesses, having taught business and innovation for many years. I think it's very important that it not be just about money, that it be about education information. So the real power there is knowledge. And um, the ability to share that knowledge takes a, a certain level of, of um, uh, I would say, understanding that not everyone is on the same page and not everyone is as acquired or, or knowledgeable about a specific topic. And often people will be misinformed. They'll be impressed or assuaged by opinion that sounds good or feels good or got a lot of you know, friends or likes on, on social media platforms and we wanna follow the crowd, but not to do that, to, to, to be a unique and um, independent in that regard. Uh, I think that women in power have a challenge to take it to a new level. And I think that, that um, looking at where charitable contributions can be made, and those charitable contributions don't have to always be financial, putting money into something, but putting care and interest into something I think is, is important, even if it's not something we're going through, to understand where the areas um, of people that may have different challenges um, and help them out with their challenges. Absolutely, and girls remember authority comes with a price and there are more responsibilities than rights too. You are watching Women Futures. Click the like button if you enjoyed the episode and subscribe to the Futurist blog. Stay tuned girls, we make the future.